Hello everyone. Today we will talk about the covering and the ventricular system of the central nervous system. So here is the objectives. Uh, just a reminder that the best way to study, it, I think, is uh, know what you are studying. So uh, you can use the objectives to and um, uh, try to explain them and teach other people and use it as an outline in the, the PowerPoint to kind of see how in depth you need to go and uh, use a book to make sure that you really understand it, uh, but then follow the objectives and this can become your study guide. The meninges means membrane in Greek. So we know that our brain and the spinal cord are pretty darn important. And in terms of all types of structures in our body, they are relatively uh, delicate. They're not bone, they're not ligament or cartilage that tough. They are delicate. So they need protection and our body does that. So we have cranial bone and uh, particular spinal column that protect the central nervous system. And uh, also this meninges and uh, the uh, uh, fluid which filled inside the hollow space and of the brain, we call it ventri ventricular system. And they also provide the extra protection. So from the superficial to deep, we have three layers of this protective tissue. Um, the first one is a dura mater. It's, it's a outermost layer in that this layer is thick. And then the, the middle layer, the acroid matter. And then the deep layer is the pure matter. The pure matter, um, we also could call it lipomeninges. Lipo, lipto means thin or fine in Greek. This part we will talk about the meninges of the brain and the spinal cord. Let's see the uh, meninges of the brain first. Dual mother means tough mother. So I give you this picture to help you remind this uh, this um, word dual mother. So the dual mother is uh, tough and uh, fibrous. The thickness of this dual mother. It's just like a cabbage leaf. So it is thick and it's opaque, so you cannot see through it. It contains a lot of collagens. And uh, this dura mater is composed by two layers. If you look at this picture, you can see, find out the uh, cranial bone. And under the cranial bone is this um, dura mater. So you can see there is um, uh, one layer which closely to the uh, cranial bone, that is parosteal layer, and uh, under it is a meningeal layer. Usually these two layers um, is tightly fused together, but there are some exceptions of those that when these two layers aren't fused. Um, so these two layer in that place could, around the uh, around the brain can create some uh, space. We call it dural venous sinus or dual space. So here's a question for you: What fluid is in the dural uh, venous sinus? Is it blood? Is that CSF? Yes, it is blood. So it is not really a vein um, like you would think it, but it, it is a space that would be filled with the same blood and that are in the veins. 
Okay, so here's another slide that shows you the two layer of the dural matter. So the peristeal layer is the external layer of the dura, and uh, it uh, tightly ad adhere to the skull, and it's uh, highly vascular, and it's pain sensitive. So if you cut the or injured the um, peristeal layer, you can feel a lot of pain. And but this uh, peristeal layer will stop at the foramen magnum if you see the uh, uh, the picture in the right lower corner you can see the foramen magnum and uh, the meningeal layer is the inner inner layer of the dura mater and uh, it is uh, relatively smooth and avascular and this layer forms the septa, septum, and we will talk about it later. The septa was formed by the deep layer of the dura mater, the meningeal layer. And this meningeal layer fold in the stick inside the uh, cranium, the uh, cerebelli, and uh, also between the cerebrum and the cerebelli. And it forms this uh, Septus, and these septus actually, um, it divide the cranial cavity and forming some of these uh, compartment. So it prevent the, um, the whole brain move in a large arrangement when we when our head moves. So it reduce the brain displacement. So the first one you can see from the upper left picture you can see this vertically oriented um, septum which separate the uh, uh, left and the right cerebral hemispheres we call it falc cerebri and then the uh, the one uh, in the middle of the cerebellum we call it falc cerebelli and between this um, cerebellum and the cerebelli we have this tentorium cerebelli the tentorium means it's like a tent it just uh, located between the um, cerebelli and the cerebrum so it's just on the top of the cerebellum The middle layer of the meninges is the acnoid matter. So if you look at this picture, you can see the yellow layer, thick layer, is a dura matter. And under the dura matter, you can see a thin green layer, that's the acnoid matter. And uh, it is um, delicate and uh, surround the brain loosely. It didn't uh, dip into the sulci. Uh, if you imagine our brain is a um, cauliflower and if you cover the cauliflower with a serene paper so the serene paper is just like this uh, acnoid matter it can cover the brain loosely and it will not dip inside into the uh, cauliflower and uh, there's a two structure we need to know one is a subacnoid space so if you see here if you see this picture the green layer of this uh, acnoid and uh, under it you can see a red layer that's a third layer pure matter so between these two layer you can see the space this space uh, we call it subacnoid um, space so we will talk about the CSF, the cerebral spinal fluid, uh, later. But the CSF, of, uh, CSF is filled inside this space. And also, here's another uh, structure that you need to know: is the the slings, this blue uh, structures between these two layer. That is um, acnoid tubercle. This connective tissues uh, 
connect the acnoid in the pia mater and uh, this can help to keep this brain suspended inside the cranial cavity and you can see between it uh, you can see a blood vessel the blood that uh, is a big vein that located in this area there is one more structure related to the acnoid matter um, that is the subacnoid cisterns uh, you know that the subacnoid space, um, which covered the whole whole brain, but in some uh, area, these um, acnoid uh, subacnoid space can like become larger. And uh, if you can see this, uh, pictures are come from your text textbook. So from the picture C, it is a mid sagittal uh, plane. Uh, we look at from the lateral side. If you can see here that the um, uh, space uh, just a posterior to the the brain stem, uh, it labeled with an M. That one is a cisterna magna. We also can call it cere cerebellar medullary cistern. Uh, so that one is the largest uh, cisterns, which located between the cerebellum and the medulla. So keep it in mind because we will, when we talk about the CSF, CSF um, flow, we will uh, talk about this again. There's one more structure related to the acnoid matter the acnoid granulations or villi. So if it is larger, we call it granulations. If it is smaller, we call it villi. If you look at this picture and uh, you can see the blue area is a dural sinus and inside the dural sinus, here's two small structures. That structure is just like a small tree. So it is, um, uh, small tufts uh, and uh, it's poking poke inside into the uh, the uh, dural sinus so that's a acnoid granulation ovili uh, these structure is consists of uh, spongy tissues but uh, it has these small tubules uh, that have a just like act as a valve. This valve can only allow one way flow. So the CSF could flow into the blood, into the in the dural sinus, but the blood inside the dural sinus cannot come out, cannot come to the um, become a CSF. So it cannot go to the subacnoid uh, space. The third layer of the meninges is the pia mater. So the pia mater is the innermost layer. If you look at this picture, you can see in the out layer is a dural mater. It is thick and it's uh, opaque that you can see, not see through. And then the the blurry layer, you can see that is a acnoid layer, but you cannot see from this picture because this pia mater is very thin and it follows the um, the uh, the brain tissue to in inside to the sulcus, and uh, this layer is highly vascular, but it's not pain sensitive. So if you if the surgeons um, cut through this pia matter, they cannot feel. But the dura matter it can cause pain. Here is another two uh, pictures that helps you give you a review of this three layer of the meninges. And uh, from the right one, you can see. Uh, the two layer of the dural mater and it forms these uh, uh, dural si venous sinus uh, and you can see the acnoid granule that 
stick inside the designers and uh, under it this blue layer this blue layer and you can see that that is a, a acnoid layer and between this is that is the trabeculae yes and you can see um, blood vessel inside it and uh, inside this acnoid uh, space uh, is uh, CSF and uh, under it you can see uh, the layer which covers the cortex of the brain and also stick inside to the uh, sulcus that is the uh, pia matter. So we already talked about the three layers of the meninges, the dura mater, the acnoid mater, and the pia mater. So we know that um, under the acnoid mater, uh, there is a um, space, actual space, we call it subacnoid space. There is uh, the uh, field with the CSF. And uh, between the dura mater and the two layer, the peristeal layer and the, the meningeal layer, here is this uh, dural venous sinus. It's filled with blood. So that is uh, in, only in that place, uh, that is uh, all, all actual space. And um, but outside and under the dural matter, here are some uh, potential space. Potential space means there is space, but normally there's nothing inside this space. But in some pathological conditions, it could, for example, have some blood inside. So outside this um, dural matter, we call it epidural space. Epi means super. It's uh, superior to this dural space, dural matter. And under the dural matter, we call it sub, subdural space. So keep this in mind. We will talk it about later. Now we will talk about the intracranial hemorrhages, the ICH. The reason we talk about this is because uh, in the clinic, you may treat a lot of patients with these conditions. And, uh, you may uh, read a lot of terms uh, inside the note and uh, you need to explain to the patient or um, you need, should know what happened with your patient. So we will talk about five types of the ICH and um, here's a YouTube uh, you can watch. In this, in this YouTube, they divide the uh, ICH into two types. The first one is the extraaxial hemorrhage, which includes epidural, subdural, and subacnoid um, hemorrhage. That means the blood is outside of the the cerebr cerebrum, but and the other uh, type is the intraaxial hemorrhage, which includes intracranial and the, the intracerebral and the intraventricular hemorrhage, which happens, the bleed happens inside the brain. So the first one will be the epidural hematoma. So the epidural space, we already talked about it, it's outside the dura mater. So there should not be, not have this actual space. It is a potential space. So this kind of um, uh, hematoma, that means the collection of the blood that pull between the cranium and the dura mater. And uh, if you look at the picture, you can see the red area, it's a blood. So this blood, Usually, the shape of the blood is bi-convex, so it's bi-convex. 
So uh, usually this uh, kind of hematoma comes from the break of the, an artery, for example, the meningeal artery. Usually the epidural hematoma caused by trauma, uh, like car incidents, like fall from a height or um, getting hit um, by some blunt object. So usually it happened with a um, skull fracture. So if you look at the picture on the top left, you can see this is a sagittal plane. Uh, and you can see on the top of the brain, here is a biconvex uh, shaped, that is the blood, which compress the press the brain tissue under it. And uh, the top right one is from the uh, coronal plane, and you can see uh, the, the blood on the top of the brain, which will damage the brain tissue. And uh, so the treatment of this uh, ha epidural hepatoma usually because this is a uh, life threatening, so we may require that we need to remove this blood from uh, from the brain, from the cranial cavity, because it will increase the uh, cranial pressure. So we may drill um, drill a hole and uh, to drain out the blood, or maybe do the uh, craniotomy to 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 remove this um, uh, blood out. And uh, after the surgery, you know that uh, this uh, zero injury may need a lot of uh, therapy to recover from the injury. The subdural hematoma, the SDH, means the blood goes into the subdural space uh, which located between the dura mater and the acnoid mater. So usually here is no actual space. So it only happens when in a pathological condition. So the blood usually come from a vein. So um, this hematoma, when you look at the picture, the blue area, you can see the shape is not bioconvex. Now it's a crescent shaped. So you look at the picture, the blue area is just like a crescent. So uh, these uh, SDH um, were more common than the epidural hemorrhages. So the reason of this SDH is um, can have a lot of uh, reason, like it can come from a, a TBI, a traumatic brain injury, um, and uh, it could happen in, like, you know that name, the shaken baby syndrome, that you uh, shake the baby ha heavily, like, um, if the head move very fast, it can have this uh, subdural hematoma, and uh, it uh, could happen in shear injury, and uh, in sometimes uh, just because of the age, because uh, with the age um, increase uh, and uh, the, um, uh, cere the the cerebral atrophy could happen, so it may tear. Um, open this uh, space and uh, cause a uh, subdural hematoma. So the treatment of the SDH, uh, usually if uh, the SDH is um, small and uh, we can just uh, monitor the patient to watch the patient if they have any headache or vomiting or any um, cranial pressure increased syndromes. So if uh, there's no um, 
further situation, you can just select the body heal itself. Uh, if um, the bleeding is large and uh, have this um, increased pressure in brain, and it can further it damage the brain tissue. So uh, and uh, craniotomy may be may need to to do. And uh, if um, there's any patient who have this uh, uh, residual deficit after uh, the SDH, when they may need therapy to get involved in to uh, get the body re recover. The picture for you uh, to compare the subdural and the epidural hematomas. So in the left side, you can see the blood is what shape? The crescent shape, right? So this uh, is a subdural hematoma. And uh, in the right side, this one, it's a bioconvexed shaped blood. So this is an epidural hematoma. So the third situation that we will talk about is a SAH, the subacnoid hemorrhage. So we have to talk about the subacnoid space. This space is um, actual space. It is between the acnoid um, matter and the pia matter. So in normal situation, here should be the CSF. You, it's filled with CSF, and um, if the blood comes into this, um, this space, we call it bleeding in the bathtub, because there is already have this space. The reason of uh, this uh, situation usually caused by an aneurysm. An aneurysm means uh, there are part there's a small part of this, um, the wall of the blood vessel can got weaker and it pouch out. And in some uh, situations, this uh, aneurysm can be can ruptured and the blood will come out to this space. The other cause uh, could be the, um, like the, uh, Malformation between the uh, artery and the venous, we call it arterial venous malformation, and um, also can cause by uh, traumatic brain injury. And the syndrome could have, like the, the patient could have very heavy headache, and it have um, vomiting because the uh, cranial pressure will be high. Uh, here's another picture for you to explain the uh, SAH. And you can see in the right side, here is a um, blood vessel, and uh, here's an aneurysm on the uh, this uh, blood vessel. So if the, this aneurysm ruptured, and uh, the brain can come out to the space. So do you know what is this um, structure inside this space? That like um, web, spider web, that is a uh, acnoid tubercle. The treatment for the SAH must be stop the bleeding from the aneurysm. You can use clip just like the in the picture use a metal clip to stop stop the bleeding or you can use a new technique we call it coiling it also can um, stop the bleeding and uh, also you can use medication to control the country uh, contraction of the um, surrounding blood vessels and uh, in some situation you may need to cranial craniotomies and uh, therapy may got involved to the for the residue um, syndromes. Okay, now come to the 
intracerebral hemorrhage, the ICH. Uh, sometimes we call it intraprecamal hemorrhage. Uh, so the precamal actually is the bulk of the of the of an organ, a functional part of the organ. So it's in inside the brain, inside the cranium. So we call it intracerebral hemorrhage. So the ICH can cause by uh, trauma, can cause by uh, bleeding, by the ruptured aneurysm, or um, high blood pressure can can also induce uh, the bleeding. In the can cause by uh, AVM or tumor. So this is a second most common type of stroke. The first one may be uh, embolism or a stroke. And uh, the treatment for this ICH should be like stop the bleeding. It's a, uh, just to stop the reason of this um, uh, syndromes, right? So the fifth one is the IVH, the intraventricular hemorrhage. So the brain have some uh, space. It's hollow inside. We have this ventricular system. So normally this ventricular should be filled with CSH, but the bleed can the blood can uh, come to any space, any space. So this ventricular could have this bleeding inside and uh, it can actually call like classified from grade one to grade four so you can see the picture in the on the right side you don't need to know what is grade one what is grade four just uh, know that grade one is least severe and grade four is most severe and um, usually the cause of this uh, um, IVH as um, for the children as um, the pre preterm birth can have this problem. Some of the kids can have this problem, and uh, uh, for adult, it can cause by trauma, can cause by aneurysm, and uh, like AVM tumor. A lot of reasons can cause this. Um, uh, intraventricular hemorrhage. So the treatment of IVH um, similar with other situations. So if uh, there's no increase uh, intracranial pressure, you can just uh, monitor. And if there is an uh, increase of this pressure, you need to do further treatment like Drain it, drain out the blood, or um, evacuate the hemorrhage. So, in some situation, you should do like cranial uh, craniotomy, or uh, if there is some um, residual functional problem, the therapist uh, should get involved in. So, if you see this picture, uh, usually the uh, ventricular system in the picture should be the black or dark area but you can see in picture a the ventricular was filled with these bright bright things that is the blood there is a review of the cranial meaning days and the space so you remember that the epidural space and the subdural space, uh, they should be potential space. In normal situation, there's nothing inside. Only uh, they only got enlarged uh, in some uh, pathological situation, and uh, the. Dural venous sinus is an um, actual space between the dural mater and uh, they filled with blood normally. And uh, the subacnoid space is between acnoid mater and the pia mater. Usually they filled with CSF. So 
under some um, pathological situation, you can fill with blood. So use this form as a uh, reference to remember where is this space the relationship of um, this durometer and the space in the uh, um, the um, pathological condition happens in which space here is an another picture that help you to remember the um, character of the five types of the hematomas. Here is a case uh, which have the four type of the ICH. You can use the note under the slides and use this picture to see what four types ICH this patient have. When come to the spinal cord, it also have three layer of meninges. It have dura mater in the outside layer. The middle one is the acnoid uh, mater, and uh, the innermost one is the pia mater. So it have the same name, and uh, between the dura mater and the acnoid mater, you have the subdural space. The, uh, between the acnoid and the pia mater, you have the subacnoid space. But uh, these um, meninges have some differences with the meninges of the brain. There are two major differences uh, between the uh, meninges of the spinal cord and the brain. So the first one is uh, uh, the spinal dura mater is only a uh, single layered. You remember that we called uh, we said the dura mater of the brain is composed by two layer. One is the outer layer, the peristeal layer, and the meningeal layer. So the dura mater for the spinal cord only have this meningeal layer, and. Uh, because the peristeal layer was stopped on the uh, foramen magnum. Remember that? So this uh, dura mater begins from uh, rustally at the foramen magnum and uh, end caudally at the uh, level of the, sec uh, the second sacral vertebra. And the second difference um, between the uh, spinal cord and the brain is um, the uh, spinal epidural space is actual space. You remember that form? The epidural space of the brain is potential. So there should be, normally there is no nothing inside that space. But uh, the epidural space for the spinal cord is an actual space. So if you see the picture um, in the lower right, uh, so you can see the number four. The number four is labeled the epidural space. So here's the actual space. And uh, thanks of that, and the, uh, when women have baby, uh, they can use this uh, epidural anesthesia and uh, to numb the, the nerves and then they will feel they will not feel pain when they have baby so normally um, the CF, CSF is still inside the um, subacronoid uh, space um, so in the epidural space there's no CSF and there is uh, some uh, lymphatic things and you have some uh, fatty tissues inside this space. Lambda cistern. Remember what is cistern? The cistern is a enlargement part of the subagnoid space. You remember when we talk about the subagnoid space of the brain, 
Um, the largest uh, cistern is a cistern magna, and uh, the lumbar cistern is the widest area of the um, acnoid space around the spinal cord. So it's located uh, at the end of the, the caudal end of the uh, spinal cord to the second sacral vertebra. And uh, this place is where we do the lumbar puncture or the spinal tap. So um, the location of this area is uh, we do the lumbar puncture for the adult is the uh, between the L3 to L4. And if for children will like a little bit lower, it's L4 um, and L5. So the purpose for we do this uh, lumbar puncture is to uh, to do some diagnostic uh, thing, like you can measure the CF, CSF uh, pressure, and uh, you can do an anesthetic uh, and or like insert dye to the CSF, do some um, diagnostic um, treatment. And uh, uh, sometimes you can like drain out the CSF to lower the pressure of the brain. And uh, as a therapist, uh, sometimes you need to treat the patient who has this lumbar puncture. So you need to know that typically the patient um, after the lumbar uh, puncture, they need to but rest for one to four hours. And uh, if uh, there is um, still have headache uh, after one or two days, they may have may have this uh, CSF leak. So that's a thing you need to keep in mind. Here is a picture which shows you the uh, posture of the uh, patient when they do lumbar puncture and uh, from the left picture you can see the needle is between the L4 and L5 so the needle will go through the uh, skin subcutaneous and go to the intraspinous uh, ligament and also need to pass through the dura mater and uh, goes to the um, subacnoid uh, space. Clinically, some of the problems with meningeal layers, you can have tumors or meningiomas, uh, meningitis, inflammation of those meningeal layers from bacteria or viruses, which can block up the, uh, can damage the blood-brain barrier, can block up uh, the uh, apertures for cerebral spinal fluid to flow, and so you can have hydrocephalus because of that. So you can have a lot of headaches, altered consciousness, depending on how bad it gets, nuchal or neck rigidity, uh, agitation, labile, which means emotionally they go from one extreme to the other, crying one moment, laughing at the next. All of that because you're getting excess pressure on the brain. Uh, an increased temperature, obviously, because your body's trying to fight off the infection. Here is another disorder of the meninges. We call it the meninge cell. The meninge cell is a protrusion of the meninges outside of the vertebral column. You can see this picture. Um, this um, meningeal cell usually happen in lumbar or sacral portion of the spinal cord, and uh, usually there's a um, uh, little um, or slight motor um, sensory deficit, but uh, it can also have this uh, vertebral column deficit. So mm, they can the surgeon can. Uh, repair the uh, vertebral column and uh, uh, remove uh, this um, protrusion by uh, surgery.
Okay, so now the, we switch gears here. Let's talk about the ventricles. You have two lateral ventricles separated by a septum pellucidum. And the lateral ventricles have an anterior horn that's out in the frontal lobe, a body that goes through the parietal lobe, a posterior horn that goes back into the occipital lobe, and an inferior horn that goes down into the temporal lobe. You have the interventricular foramina of Monroe, and then you have the third, which connects the cerebral spinal fluid and the lateral ventricles to the third ventricle. And then you have the cerebral aqueduct of Sylvius, which carries cerebral spinal fluid from the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle. This picture shows you the ventricles we talk about, and uh, we fill these uh, ventricles with clay and then remove the brain, and then we got these models. So you can see the uh, Picture A shows you the uh, whole ventricle system from the lateral side. The la left side will be the anterior. The right side will be the posterior. And the picture B just uh, turn this uh, model a little left, and then you can see the anterior part. So uh, you can see the uh, lateral ventricle is a bigger part of the ventricle system, and it, it has anterior horn, the body, and then the posterior horn and the inferior body. And uh, the part which uh, combine the posterior horn and the inferior horn and the, um, the body, it is an atrium. And you can see uh, under this um, uh, lateral ventricle, you have this uh, interventricle foramen, and then under this, you have that in the uh, third ventricle with a hole in the middle, and then it connects with a little tube that is a um, uh, aqueduct. And then under it, you have a triangular shape, a pyramid shaped fourth ventricle. And from the picture C, you can see that is a ventricle system from the superficial view. And uh, the picture D shows you the ventricular system from the inferior view. Here is the structures of the lateral ventricle we talked about from the last picture. And uh, each uh, of these uh, lateral ventricle have five basic components. And you have left lateral ventricle and right lateral ventricle. And uh, usually the CSF will come out from the lateral ventricle, from the interventricular foramen and then go to the third ventricle. Here is a picture shows you the lateral ventricle which located in the brain. And uh, you can see this is a, la a picture from the lateral view. So the lateral ventricle located in the front and temple and occipital and, temp and uh, uh, parietal lobe. So here is the structures of the third ventricle. So you may ask why third ventricle, where is one and two? And so the first and the second ventricle actually the left and the right let the uh, lateral ventricle. So um, this picture is shows you the lateral view of the third ventricle. But uh, if you look at the ventricular system from the anterior view, you will see the third ventricle actually is a very thin slit. Um, so this slit actually is formed by the surface of the thalamus, and uh, we will talk talk about later, and uh, also formed by the hypothalamus. So the third ventricle connect superiorly to the interventricular foramen, 
and uh, inferiorly will be the cerebral aqueduct. Here is another picture shows you the location of the third ventricle. And you can see in the right side this picture. Uh, the superior part will be the left and right uh, lateral ventricle. And under it, there is a part with, with a hole in the middle. That is the third ventricle. So the fourth ventricle is the lower part of the ventricular system. You can see from the picture, and uh, we call it it's a pyramid-shaped ventricle because it have the apex on the top and the uh, triangular shape on the uh, bottom. Uh, so it's located between the brainstem and the cerebellum. So it's behind the palm and the upper part of the medulla and uh, anterior to the uh, cerebellum. So the fourth ventricle superiorly connect to the uh, aqueduct and inferiorly it have um, four uh, foramen to let the CSF come out. And uh, there are left and the right lateral aperture. And so we also call it a foramina of Lushka. And uh, you have the median aperture and you have also connect to the um, central canal of the spinal cord. So the CFF can come out from these foramens. Here is another picture which shows you the ventricular system from different view inside the brain. You have the lateral view, you have the posterior view, superior view, and uh, the right lower picture is a whole ventricular system from the posterior side. So we talked about the ventricular system. Actually, the ventricular system is uh, the uh, space where the uh, CSF flowed inside. So the CSF produced by a structure we called uh, choroid plexi. The choroid plexi, you can see from this picture under, under the, the words, you can see um, the picture A and uh, picture B is from the lateral view and uh, picture C is from the posterior view uh, from the uh, ventricular system. And you can see the red tissues is a choroid plexi. So the choroid plexi located at the uh, body and uh, the inferior horn and uh, for the uh, lateral ventricle and the roof of the third ventricle and also the roof of the fourth ventricle so it uh, present in each ventricles so as this um, csf uh, flows through this ventricle system and uh, more is made and added in the each ventricle CSF. It uh, formed by uh, specialized uh, epithelial uh, cells. So that's the flow of the cerebral spinal fluid. Lateral ventricles, interventricular foramen Monroe, third ventricle, cerebral aqueduct sylvius, fourth ventricle. Once it gets down to the fourth ventricle, some of it will trickle down into the central canal in the spinal cord, but most of it then exits the fourth ventricle and goes into the subarachnoid space, either by the median aperture or the two lateral apertures, which are holes in the roof of the fourth ventricle. So the cerebral spinal fluid then gets into the subarachnoid space and percolates through the subarachnoid space, which covers the brain and the, the spinal cord. And then that cerebral spinal fluid gets reabsorbed by arachnoid villi, 
which are just projections on the roof of the of the sinuses, subarachnoid space, and the reabsorbed cerebral spinal fluid then gets reabsorbed into the venous circulation from the um, si the sinuses. So the cerebral spinal fluid goes percolates through all those ventricles and then ends up in the venous circulation. Here's another picture which shows you the details of uh, what we talk about the circulation of the CSF. And uh, this is a lateral view of the sagittal plane um, of the brain. And you can see the right side will be the anterior part, the left side will be the posterior part. And uh, anteriorly you have the brainstem, posteriorly you have the cerebellum. So use this as a reference to um, think about the CSF flow uh, such circulation again. We talked about uh, the circulation of the CSF. So what is the reason how this CSF floating um, from one place to another place? And uh, the mechanism of this flow is uh, first one will be um, the uh, pulsatile at this um, artery pulsate because it's close to these uh, arteries inside the brain and uh, it causes a movement. And uh, the second one will be the pressure gradient, uh, gradient system. So uh, the pressure is higher uh, in the uh, subarachnoid space compared to the pressure in the dural venous sinus. And so the CSF will flow from the higher pressure to the lower pressure. So the um, CSF uh, keep circulate, and uh, usually the CSF will uh, circulate uh, three or four times for the whole day. And uh, why we have this circu um, this uh, circulation? Uh, the function of this. Uh, circulation, the CSF circulation is first, it can provide an environment uh, for the brain and spinal cord in to, to be suspended because you know that the brain and the spinal cord is a delicate organ and it's inside a bony cavity. So if the brain and the spinal cord keep bouncing to the uh, bone, it can be injured. So this CSF can um, provide or provide um, buoyancy to reduce um, the uh, traction on the nerve and the blood vessel. And uh, the second one is um, the CFF uh, can be a spatial buffer. And uh, the third one will be like um, this uh, circulation can remove uh, the substance unwanted and uh, it can move move away this um, unwanted substance from the uh, CNS uh, for further injury. And uh, it can also provide it the, uh, a chemical environment. It provides a stable ionic for the signal transform for the uh, nerve cells. It's very important. So here's a fu function of the CSF. We've talked about the CSF uh, circulation. Um, so the uh, CSF produced by the choroid plexi and then circulated inside the ventricular system and then keep go back to the vein. So it, this uh, circle can be affected by some situations uh, and it can cause the disorder of this uh, ventricular system. So hydrocephalus is a dilation of the ventricles. It can came from uh, like three primary issues uh, like it can have this uh, 
excess CSF production or block of the circulation or impeded uh, CSF um, reabsorption. So uh, these dilated ventricles can, uh, because the cranial cavity is not flexible, so this pr uh, increased pressure can um, pressure uh, can put pressure on the uh, surrounded brain tissues. So clinically, the hydrocephalus can be divided into uh, communicating, that means a non-obstructive uh, hydrocephalus and non-communicating uh, or obstructive hydrocephalus. Here is a condition which, uh, because of this uh, excess CSF projection, uh, the papillomas, and this is a tumor of uh, uh, choroid plexus. In, the, in this situation, this uh, choroid plus, uh, plexus can um, cause this increased CSF production, so and in, then cause this uh, hydrocephalus. Second situation is a blocked uh, circulation of the CSF. So this may be the most common um, reason of the hydrocephalus. So the most common reason for this one usually be the tumor. So if the tumor is near to one of the intraventricular uh, foramen, so it will got maybe one la enlarged lateral ventricle. And uh, if uh, this tumor happen in uh, like close to the uh, cerebral aqueduct, like uh, pineal gland tumor that can block the very narrow and long cerebral aqueduct. Uh, so it will cause an enlarged third ventricle and um, lateral ventricle because the CSF cannot come down to the uh, fourth ventricle, so it's blocked. It's um, uh, non-communicated uh, hydrocephalus and uh, the fourth ventricle will not be enlarged because they can produce their own CSF but uh, um, it not be uh, enlarged. The blocked circulation of the CSF could also happen when the circulation was obstructed outside the ventricular system. For example, the subacnoid uh, hemorrhage could also block the subacnoid space, then further uh, block the circulation of the CSF, and also the meningitis um, that can cause this space become clogged. And um, so this picture shows you this uh, annoyed uh, carry malformation. Um, this, in this um, malformation, uh, part of this uh, cerebellum and medulla was displayed through the uh, uh, foramen magnum. So it blocked the CSF flow. And um, this situation usually associated with the uh, spinal bifida. So the spinal bifida can cause this um, malformation and then further cause this uh, hydrocephalus. So both result in all ventricular, uh, ventricular system being uh, hydrocephalic. Cephalic. The impeded reabsorption of the ACSF uh, is rare but it's uh, usually a uh, relationship with the congenital absence of this um, villi. You remember the villi, the little, the little tree just pouch out to the, um, uh, the, the, venous, the, the sinus venous, and uh, this can cause the old ventricle hydrocephalic. So how do you diagnose? Hydrocephalus, well, with an MR, MRI or CAT scans to see the size of the ventricles, spinal taps to measure cerebral spinal fluid pressure, 
and ways of treating it, you, they can put a shunt in there, okay, to kind of drain that excess uh, cerebral spinal fluid. There's another disorder of the ventricular system is this uh, increased intracranial pressure, ICP. Um, there's a lot of uh, situation can cause uh, this ICP. It could happen like in uh, brain hemorrhage or tumor or like CSF increase, uh, cerebral uh, edema and uh, like venous ob obstruction and it can cause this uh, blood volume increase and then further increase this uh, intracranial uh, pre uh, pressure. So uh, the patient could have this uh, very severe headache, can have nausea and vomiting, and also could have this slow heart rate and uh, high blood pressure, and maybe loss of uh, consciousness. So uh, if this situation become more seriously, the pressure become too high and it can press the brain because the um, brain is soft. It can squeeze uh, the brain out and then cause this brain hernia. So the brain um, like uh, come out from the cranial cavity, so it moves through the uh, foramen magnum. It's a life-threatening situation. The treatment of the ICP is to remove the underlying cause, like tumor, you need to remove the tumor. If there is too much CSF, you need to drain out uh, the CSF. If there is a hemorrhage, you need to um, take out, remove the, um, the blood, the excess blood uh, from the brain cavity. And you may need to uh, do this um, cranial tomates. So as a therapist, we may have some patient who have this deficit resulting from the damage of the brain tissue but we need to keep in mind that if uh, the intracranial pressure is too high, the therapy will be limited and uh, the head of the bed, it needs to be remain elevated and uh, you can sometimes, the pa if the patient have the drainage tube from the brain, and then you can not adjust the level of the head due to the pressure and the drain. And uh, for some situation, the patient may remove part of the cranial bone and they may have the helmet um, for the head protection. So keep this in mind.